thank you all for joining us, and I'm grateful for the opportunity to read a verse from the Bible and to share what David said I would be sharing about the message of salvation. To do that, I want to read one verse in the New Testament in the book of Galatians, chapter 2. Galatians chapter 2, and I'd like to read verse 20. This is what it says, Galatians 2 and 20. The writer of this is the Apostle Paul. Before he became a Christian, he was known as Saul, and Saul from Tarsus, but we know him as Paul. But he writes here and he says, I am crucified with Christ, nevertheless I live, yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. Let me reduce our focus down for this time together to just the last part of the verse. Where Paul says, I now live in the flesh. The life I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. You see, the Bible does talk about the good news, the gospel of your salvation. That's what Paul said when he wrote to the Ephesians, Christians in the city of Ephesus. He talked about the, the gospel, the good news about your salvation. Well, here in this verse, he's talking about, not about your salvation, talking to other people, he's actually talking about his own salvation. His own salvation. In fact, if you read in the book of the Acts, if you read the book of the Acts, you would find that his story of how he came to receive the Savior and salvation is recorded for us three times in Acts chapter 9, chapter 22, and chapter 26. And through his writings in the New Testament, every so often, he gives a description of what he understood, what happened when he became a Christian. Those of you who know the Bible might be thinking of 1 Timothy 1 and 15, a time when he talks about, gives us a little insight as to what happened, what he understood when he was saved. Well, here we have another one of those statements. And what I want you to notice is that salvation here, it's not what he, what he felt. Many people want to know when they hear about being saved and they think about it, what will I feel when I'm being saved? Paul never talks about what he felt. In fact, what he talks about more is what he came to know, what he came to understand. And really specifically here in this verse, he talks about by the faith. It's what he came to believe. So if you're interested in salvation tonight, there is something you are going to have to come to believe in order to be saved. That's what happened to the Apostle Paul. In fact, that's what happened to everybody in the New Testament who received salvation. And everybody today who is truly saved has a moment when they came to know, to understand, and believe. And so I want to look at this statement by the Apostle Paul, this great statement about his salvation. The first thing I want you to think about is, is how precious this is, the preciousness of salvation. Because he ne he says, he says, the life I now live. He says, now I'm alive. Now. Now I am alive. You see, he says, I live. You say, wait a minute, wait a minute. If you know anything about this man, you would know that he had one of the greatest educational privileges of his time. He was taught, he sat at the feet of a great Jewish rabbi called Gamaliel. It wasn't like he went to a community college. He went to the Ivy League of Jewish rabbis. And he sat at this man's feet. And he was listening to the greatest teacher at that time, Gamaliel. You say, was he not feeling, was he not alive at that point? Well, he was physically living. But he says, no, 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 I, I, I wasn't alive. I'm living now. I didn't have it then, but I have it now. You see, education. And learning even about the Bible is different than having life, having salvation. You say, well, you were a very religious man, Saul of Tarsus. In fact, he even says of that he was. He says, I was a Hebrew of the Hebrews. He was a super Jew. He was so dedicated. And he was a, 
He was blameless when it came to the law. And he tried to do everything he could. But he says, that's when I, I wasn't alive then. I, I was physically alive, of course. But he said, I didn't have spiritual eternal life. I wasn't saved. But he says, now I live. I live. You say, so Paul, did you not live a period in your life when you were trying to do everything to live the best of your ability? Were you not trying to stay away from evil things? He says, you know, I was a Pharisee and the Pharisees. That group of people that tried to stay away from everything that was bad, he said, I was a super Pharisee. I it was one who was extra dedicated. But he says, listen, when all of that was going on, I was dead spiritually. But he says, now I live, I'm saved, I'm alive, I'm spiritually alive. Can you see how precious this is? Can I ask you today, this evening, do you go back to a time in your life, a time when you became alive spiritually, when you received spiritual eternal life? That's what the Bible calls it. Paul says, now I've got it. I live. I live. But you know, some people have the idea that this is this is this is something that's small. No, this is the this is the core of human existence. This is what you're missing. To have the spiritual life that Paul received, to have salvation. That's what he came to know, that's what he came to believe, and that's what he came to enjoy. You say, well, if he's alive now, spiritually, what was he then? You see, he was what he called when he wrote to the Ephesians. He said, dead in your trespasses and sins. You're dead. In what sense are you dead? If you're not saved, what sense are you dead? Well, you remember that Adam and Eve lived in the Garden of Eden, and God put them there, and they enjoyed communication and contact and, and, and fellowship with God, and they were on the same page as God until they sinned. And at that point, God said, get out. The communication stopped. They could no longer be with him. Remember what God said, what happened? He said, in the day you eat, you'll die. Your spiritual life, it's gone. There's nothing there. You're spiritually dead. You're dead. In that sense, Paul says, you know, before I had all of that, I was dead. What's the idea of being dead? When a person is dead, you can no longer have a relationship with them. There's no point in talking to a person who's dead. They can't respond. You see, that's how God looks down and he sees us for the same reason. Because of our trespasses and sins, he says, you're not alive. Oh, you're religious. You're learning from the Bible, about the Bible. You're praying. You're doing the best you can. Paul was a family man. He had a family. We read about some of his family members. But just because you have all of that, even if you do it all well, maybe you know Christians, and you do those things better than they do. You see, you can do all those things and be like Saul, like Paul, and be spiritually dead with no relationship with God and no possibility of a relationship with God. It's all religion. It's all just there, but it's not true life. Paul says, now, I used to have that, but he says, I want to tell you something. I remember it. I live now. I'm alive spiritually. That's what Jesus, the Lord Jesus said. He said, I'm come that you might have life and that you'll have it to the full, that you'll really come to life spiritually. And if we just go out into the future, the trajectory of a person who in their sins, what does the Bible say happens to them when they die physically? Describes a horrible future, a horrific end where people will stand before the Lord and there will be a judgment of a great on a, where he'll sit on a great white throne and people will be assigned a level of punishment in a lake that is burning with fire. What is that place called? You know, it's interesting. The Bible calls it the second death. The second death, the final separation. Lifeless relationshipless with God, without God for all eternity. That's why Paul says, this is the best thing that's ever happened to me. I live. Could you say that today? Can you go back to a time in your life 
when for the first time you believed and you understood and you knew and you had eternal life, you were saved. The preciousness of it. He says, I live. I now live. The wonderful thing today, if on this Sunday, you were to look back the rest of your life and for all eternity and say, from that day forward, I've been in a lie. I've been saved. It's the greatest thing that will ever happen to you. The salvation of your soul when you receive eternal life. But notice what he says. He says, this life I live in the flesh. So many people have the idea that, that salvation and knowing you're going to heaven and having eternal life. Nobody can know that. Nobody can have that now. You'll only find out if you got it or not. If you received it or not, after you die, if somehow there'll be an envelope and they'll pull it out in heaven and some angel will open it up for Peter himself or some something will happen in some way. Or you'll look the list and there'll be those the haves and the have nots and you'll find your name or you won't find your name. None of that kind of thing is in the Bible. Paul says you can know now. He says, I live. He says, I know it. I know whom I believed. These things are written unto you, says John, that ye may know that ye have eternal life. And so again, I ask you, I ask you, do you have enough? Please do not have, go on with the idea that I'll find out after later on. You need to know now, this is the most important, the best thing, the most vital thing, the issue of salvation. And Paul says, in the flesh, the life I live in the flesh, I live. I'm truly alive. And you can have it today. You could enjoy this great blessing. Doesn't matter what's going on in your life. You could have this great blessing right now. And truly be spiritually alive. Enter into a real genuine relationship with your creator. And you don't need my word. Take Paul's word for it. He just says out of everything, the best thing is that I'm alive. But I want you to think about this because this is personal. This is very personal. He says, I live. By the son, by faith of the son of God who loved me and he gave himself for me. This salvation is precious. It's present right now. And it's personal, very personal. We get used to talking about things in broad terms, don't we? Well, we talk about taxes and our taxes are going, our taxes are going up our taxes when it comes right down to april 15th it doesn't matter whether your taxes went up or not the question is what's going to happen to mine that's what it concerns me and whether my taxes go up or not that really doesn't concern doesn't affect you it's what about your taxes we talk about the number of people affected with coronavirus or the the people who are when it comes right down to it what really matters is not the other people. What about you? And if you've had it, you would understand what I'm talking about. I haven't had it, thankfully, but that's what I've seen with it. It's what about your health? Health is very personal. There are students likely listening. We talk about, well, we in a class, all the students, we didn't do well on that exam. We didn't. We didn't do well. Our grades are not going, our grade. When it's all said and done, does it matter what the other 25 people in the class, what their grades are? The only thing that counts is what are your grades? You see, the day that Paul was saved, he began. And us and we. He suddenly began to think about his own personal relationship with God. His own sins against God. That he, for example, he tells about it in the book of Romans that he was coveting. He began to think about his own responsibility for what he had done when he had broken God's law. Not when he had kept God's law, but when he had broken God's law. That was what began to be important to him. You see, that's a tremendous thing when that happens to a person. When suddenly there's the big switch. And you begin to focus right in on your own situation. Am I saved or am I not? Not are we saved or are we not? It's our am I. And you ask the question to yourself, do I, do I have eternal life? Am I truly living? Do I have a relationship with God? What about my sins? What's going to happen in my future? 
What about my eternity? You see, it's personal. The other passage, when Paul talks about his story of salvation, he references it. He talks about how Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. And then he adds, of whom I am chief. You see, he just quickly, he put himself, this, I'm first. All I'm focusing on is my sin. Would to God today that that would be your experience. That you would stop thinking about sinners and sins. And may the weight of it all, the responsibility, the burden for your responsibility, for your sins and your trespasses, your condition before God, it would be weighed upon you. If it settled into your soul and began to bother your conscience, it would be a great day because salvation is absolutely essential because salvation is a personal matter. But I'd like to close by reminding you that salvation is not just not just a precious thing and it's a present thing. Thank God we get it now. We don't have to wait for it. And it's very personal. But I would like you to think with me about how it's provided. That's what he appreciates here. It's 100% provided. It wasn't that he learned about a salvation sharing plan. Where he shares part and the Lord shares part. It's not a co-op. Where you work together to solve this problem of sins and trespasses and the responsibility and punishment for them. And, and you put your two minds together and you, you get like yoked together like two animals and you work together to get the, the, no, no, no. Paul says, I believed something that had nothing to do with me. My salvation depends 100% on the son of God who loved me and he gave himself for me. When a person talks about salvation and then they introduce what I did, that person is likely not saved because in the Bible, salvation is 100% dependent upon the Son of God, on the Lord Jesus. It is either 100% on him, it's all his responsibility, it's all his work, or there's no salvation. That's why the Bible says, neither is there salvation in any other. For there's none other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. That has to be found in him. Your salvation has to be found in the Lord Jesus Christ, the Son of God, or you will never be saved. So get your eyes, get your focus off yourself. What is there in him? What about him? What is it that you don't know, that you don't understand, or that you haven't believed? Let me tell you quickly about the excellence of this salvation, because look who it depends on. Paul says it depends on the Son of God. The Son of God. You know what that means? That's great news. Because remember, the issue at stake is the issue of your sins. If you're going to have your sins taken care of, you need somebody who knows all of those sins to be able to take care of them, don't you? When he says he's the Son of God, God, by definition, knows all. And that means the Son of God knows all. Paul says, I know I'm saved. I know I live. I'm living. I know it. It's all dependent on somebody who knew all about my problem. Well, it's, it is uncomfortable to think that somebody knows about our sins. It is actually a good thing. Because he can make us face those sins. He can deal with them all. He is the son of God who dealt with our sin. Remember that one day the one who will sit on the throne and carry out judgment will be the same son of God sitting on that throne. The one who knows all sin has all sin written down in heaven. The son of God, Paul says, the all-knowing one, my salvation is excellent because it depends on someone who knows all. But by definition, God can do all. He's omnipotent. And the son of God, being his son, has that same attribute. He can do all. He's the almighty, the all-powerful God. And he showed that. All things were made by him, and without him was not anything made that was made. He created everything. And he commanded. You remember, he commanded wind, and it stopped. 
He commanded disease and it was gone. He commanded demons and they fled. He commanded death even. And death released its hold and people came back to life. Why? Because he's the son of God. All power. He has all possibilities available to him with divine power to bring it about. I want you to know something else. Son of God means if God is absolutely holy, that means his son must be holy. When he before he was born, the promise was the holy thing that shall be born of you shall be called the son of God. He's holy. What does that mean? It means he does not have sin and he could not sin. God cannot lie. God cannot sin. That means he could not fail. What a great news. Paul says, I want you to know that my salvation depends on a person who knows all about my sin. He's a person who has all possibilities available to him. And he's a person who, who, who in himself has absolutely no sin to worry about. No concern for himself. His only concern then is going to be my sin. And what are the possibilities he has? Well, he only has one possibility to deal with my sin. Paul says the only possibility on the table was. He had to give himself. He had to die. He had to suffer as a substitute. He had to absorb the punishment that Paul deserved for his sins. That was the only option. He couldn't create. He couldn't command. He had to come. He had to become into the world to save sinners. He had to become a man, the son of God. He had to go to the cross. He couldn't do it any other way. Paul said he's the son of God who did it. The excellence of my salvation. Who does your salvation depend on? I'm so glad my salvation doesn't depend on me. It depends on him, the excellence of it. But think with me as well about the extremity of it. He says he's the son of God. What was that old, that unique, the only, the own, the, the, the only uh, available method and manner to put away sin? It was that he gave himself he couldn't give an animal he couldn't give lots of animals he couldn't give anybody else he couldn't give angels because he was the only holy one being the son of god he had to give himself it was to that extreme and on the cross so long ago he gave himself he even in the posture of it all he opened himself up he gave himself to the suffering of the cross, to the punishment that came down from God when God laid on him the iniquity of us all. When God made him to be sin for us, he took that all. He absorbed it. He received it. That's what was he had to do. There was no other way to save us. It was the only way he could save Paul. And I want to tell you, I discovered back on March 31st, 1974, that long ago. That's what I discovered. That's what I came to know. I came to understand, and I believed it was true. And since then, I live. And you can live today, too. The extremity. You say, was it all necessary for me? Recently, I went through a few weeks of a skin treatment. When you live out in Phoenix, many people out here have problems with the sun, especially when you're fair-skinned. And I had to put this chemotherapy cream on in my face, and it burned it. It was very uncomfortable. But anyway... What struck me was when I went to the doctor and she gave me this prescription, she said, now, here it is. She said, you go get a fill and you use as much of this as you need. As much of this as you need. Can I ask you today, how much of the suffering and death of the Lord Jesus did Paul need? How much of the suffering, death, the shed blood of the Lord Jesus, do you need? How much of his work? Paul says, I want to tell you something. He says, I want to tell you. He's the son of God who loved me, and he gave himself for me. I needed it all. I needed it all for me. And I can say the same. What about you today? How much of the Lord Jesus do you need? I want to tell you, you need them all. And he's all available. The excellence of salvation, it depends on the Son of God. The extremity of salvation, this provision, he actually went and he gave his own life on the cross 
to provide salvation for lost, guilty, dead sinners like you and I. But let me just remind you before I pray about the enthusiasm in this provision. You know, there are painters and illustrators and cinematographers who have actually tried to paint what they think Jesus was like or present Jesus when he was going to the cross. How do they paint? Why do they always present him the same way? First of all, he's long hair and he's he's messy and he, that wasn't the way the Lord Jesus was at all. But anyway, that's beside the point. And they have him carrying the cross and he's and there's this horrific look on his face and he's miserable. Well, you say, wasn't he in awful pain? I don't want to take anything away from the pain of our Lord Jesus. It was infinite. I don't know what the expression on his face was, and they don't either. But what I do know, what I do know is what Paul knew. I knew, I know what was in his heart. I know what he was thinking. Paul knew. That's what he came to understand and believe when he was saying. He said, this man who did this, it was not this man who was do completing drudgery. He was plugging along and he was trying to get. No, he says, I look right into his heart and what do I see? The enthusiasm. He did it because he loved me. He did it with love. And he was thinking of me. He's the son of God who loved me and he gave himself all the enthusiasm of heaven was behind him when he gave his life at the cross for Paul. Bows my heart with wonder and with thanksgiving. When I think about my salvation, I don't deserve it. It's dead, helpless, lost. And then I understood. My problem is my sin, but the same son of God loved me. And he gave himself for me. My salvation is just as excellent as Paul's because it depends on the same son of God. My salvation was just as extreme as, it, as Paul's was. It required that the son of God give himself for me. And it was just as enthusiastic. He did it just with the same amount of enthusiasm and love. He did it because he loved me. And I'll never be able to thank him enough. What about your salvation? What about the salvation God is offering you today? Why don't you claim it? Why don't you come to understand and to realize what you need and what he has done? And take it personally the son of god who loved me and he gave himself for me when a person comes to have that reality in their life they can say like paul now i live right here and now i live i'm alive you enter into a real genuine relationship with god that you'll enjoy for all eternity i recommend it i implore you to come to faith in the son of god and may you appreciate it personally like paul did when he said I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and he gave himself for me.